Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Rolls-Royce holding stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Rolls-Royce Holdings is a British aerospace and defense company that designs, manufactures, and distributes power systems for aviation and other industries. Its civil aerospace division is a major manufacturer of engines for large commercial aircraft, regional jets, and business aviation markets. Its power systems division is a leading provider of high-speed engines, propulsion, and power generation systems for the marine, defense, and industrial markets. The Defense Division is a market leader in engines for military transport and patrol aircraft with strong positions in combat and helicopter applications. They also support the nuclear power plant for the Royal Navy's submarine fleet. Its ITP Aero Division develops, manufactures, assembles, and tests engine components. It provides maintenance, repair, and overhaul services for regional airlines, business aviation, industrial, and defense applications. The company is planning to sell its ITP Aero Division for £2 billion. This will help improve its balance sheet. In 1884, Henry Royce started an engineering business. In 1906, Charles Rolls and Henry Royce created a separate business to sell cars. In the 1970s, the company filed bankruptcy and stopped making cars. BMW subsequently acquired the name and currently makes Rolls-Royce cars. But the company we're looking at is the second largest manufacturer of aircraft engines after GE and the world's 16th largest defense contractor. The last dividend it paid was in April 2020, and they suspended future dividends due to weak sales from COVID. The company announced it is leading the transition to net zero carbon, and it plans to achieve this by 2050 the latest. They said it will focus on its technological capabilities to enable the global economy to get to net zero carbon by 2050, which includes aviation, shipping, and power generation. Its contribution includes the development of all electric components for the aviation sector and a hybrid electric propulsion system for aerospace. It is currently investing heavily into its space program, similar to Tesla, Amazon, and other big companies. It is working with Virgin Galactic to develop a supersonic aircraft that will be able to carry between 9 to 19 passengers, and it will travel three times the speed of sound. Rolls-Royce and the UK Space Agency have signed an agreement to study the application of nuclear energy in space exploration. Lots of exciting things on the horizon for this company. The company is headquartered in London, England and was founded in 1904. It started trading in 1990 and can be found on the Pink Sheets, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, and London Stock Exchange. We're looking at the ticker that trades on the London Stock Exchange, so all the numbers in this video are in British pounds. The company also trades on the pink sheets. The ticker is RYCEY, RYCE. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 9.1 billion market cap. They're trading at 109 pence or 1.09 pounds, and they have 8.4 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have positive free cash flow in 18 and 19, but a big negative in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's negative in 18, 19, and 20, but they finally had positive net income in the trailing 12 months, 2.6 billion pounds. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that peaked in 2019. Demand was a lot lower in 2020 due to COVID, so that came down to 11.8 billion, then 11.3 billion in the trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. In 2020, 42% of their revenue came from civil aerospace. 22% from power systems, 28% from defense, those are mainly government contracts, and 6% from the division it plans to sell, ITP Arrow, and then 2% from other. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the costs to manufacture the engines and the products it makes. Also administrative costs, research and development costs go in here as well. And there were a lot of write-offs in 2020 and the trailing 12 months from the financial and operational impact of COVID-19. There's lots of non-cash items on the income statement that bring down your net income and even your operating income. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. That was negative in 2020, but positive in the other years. Below that is operating expenses. 
And then SGNA, which is mainly payroll and marketing, that came down a lot, down to 800 million pounds in the trailing 12 months. It was 1.6 billion in 2018. They will always have research and development costs because they always need to come out with new products. That's around 700 million pounds a year. And they do have negative operating income each year. So that's not a good sign. They pay 200 million of interest on their debt. And they did have positive net income for the first time in a while in the trailing 12 months, negative in prior years. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They were really struggling since 2015, but things were really picking up. In 2018 and 19, they did generate a lot of operating cash flow, over 2 billion pounds, and they had positive free cash flow those years. But then in 2020, due to lower demand from COVID, things got really bad and they had negative operating cash flow again. Luckily, they were able to get financing to get through 2020. But things are looking a little better since their negative was smaller in the trailing 12 months. Here's a breakdown of their cash flow from operations. What really stood out to me was this negative 2.7 billion pounds from changes in receivables and payables. If this number is really high, either really positive or really negative, sometimes I ignore it because it could really skew the numbers. Say in 2019, they bought a lot of product on credit. Say they purchased a few billion pounds using accounts payable. That's a cash inflow when they use the accounts payable, but when they actually pay for the items, which could be the next business year, then it's a cash outflow. So it could make it look like you're losing a lot of cash the year you pay for those items even though you actually bought the items in a prior reporting period. Say for instance, they sold a billion pounds of engines to a company, but they didn't receive any cash. They sold the items on credit using accounts receivables. So they do book the revenue to the income statement. So their net income looks okay, but they don't receive cash flow. It's actually a negative cash flow for this period. Because you can see in 2019, they had a positive 73 million pounds in the same category and they had positive 2.5 billion of cash flow. So if we stripped out this one number, their cash flow would almost be zero. And the reason I strip it out, because changes in accounts payable and accounts receivable is really a timing thing. All the other items on the cash flow statement are more relevant to the current time period. And they had a ton of write-offs in 2020, 900 million pounds, 820 million, 730 million. So that really brought down their net income in 2020. Because it's a non-cash item on the income statement, we have to add it back on a statement of cash flows. That's what's helpful with the CFO section. It adjusts for the non-cash items on the income statement. So you can look at everything in cash terms. So what I'm trying to say is this negative 3 billion isn't as bad as it seems because it's mostly due to the changes in accounts payable and accounts receivables. And since they're a manufacturing company, they do spend a lot in CapEx. 1.6 billion in 2018, down to 700 million in the trailing 12 months. Demand is lower, so CapEx is lower, but when demand gets back up there, I'm sure CapEx will increase again. And it looked like they may go bankrupt in 2020 because they were getting really close to that point in 2019. And then when COVID hit, the stock price got really low, but they were able to get financing. They raised 2 billion of equity and almost 5 billion of debt. They paid down 3 billion of debt, so they added 2 billion of debt. So they raised 4 billion pounds through debt and equity financing. This got them through 2020 without going bankrupt. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have negative 4.6 billion of equity. They have negative 8.4 billion of retained earnings. And this is mainly due to the struggles they had since 2015. And of course it got worse when COVID came. Let's look at the capital structure, negative 4.6 billion of equity. So their liabilities are 4.6 billion more than their assets. And they have 8 billion of debt. They have 5 billion of net debt. So they have a good amount of cash on their balance sheet and their weighted average cost of capital is 8.35%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 27 billion pounds. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of 22 billion pounds. We divide that by 8.4 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 2.58 pounds. They're trading at 1.09 pounds. So they're trading at a 58% discount. It's a strong buy according to the model. According to Simply Wall Street, the average analyst forecast is for their revenue to grow 6.6%. I projected their revenue to grow 6.6% in 2021, 22, 23, and 24. 
And the average company converts 10% of their revenue to free cash flow. So that's how I got their future free cash flow. It's 10% of their revenue. And since 2021 is still not such a great year, I gave them negative free cash flow. I thought by now things would be 100% back to normal. If things are still like they are next year, like they are now, they may have negative free cash flow in 2022. But I think things will get a lot better next year at this time. Simply Wall Street is also saying they're undervalued. They're valuing the stock at 1.7 pounds. Six analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 123 pence. Two of the analysts rate this a buy for a hold. This is where the stock has been trading since 1988. The company was doing well from 2010 to 2015. And they did a five for one stock split because the stock price was pretty high at that point. So it was 20 pounds a share and it brought it down to four pounds. But since then, the stock price hasn't done that well. It did come down and back up, but then it really came down. This big decline in 2015 was mainly what the new CEO said. This article is from 2015. He said there's issues with the company he was not aware of. And he doesn't expect the company to recover until 2017 and they may cut their dividend. And one analyst said the stock may go down 80%. That analyst should get a big reward because I think the stock did go down about 80%. This is a candlestick chart the last 12 months. It was down to 35 pence. It looked like the company was probably gonna file bankruptcy, but it managed to get funding and it was able to stay in business. So the stock price went way back up. You can see all these green candlesticks, a lot of buy orders put in. And then on this day, it looks like the stock went way up. You can see this really big green line. When there's a big green line down here, that means the buy orders are higher than the sell orders. When there's more buy orders, the stock price goes up. When there's more sell orders, the stock price goes down. And if you see a green candlestick, that just means the closing price is higher than the opening price for that day. It looks like the stock opened at 70 pence and it closed at 100 pence. And it has such a huge wick. When there's a wick above the candlestick, that means the stock traded above its closing price in midday. The closing price for this day was 100 pence. But it looks like the stock got way up there, up to 135 pence. 35% higher than a closing price. That's just a crazy big wick. You don't see it usually this big. And you could see a wick on the bottom because it's possible the stock did trade below its opening price during the day sometime. When it appeared the company was not going bankrupt, the stock went way up to about 135 pence. Since then it has moved up and down, but it really hasn't increased since this point. When you see a really big candlestick like this in green, there could have been a really big news story or they may have come out with really good earnings. And they have a beta of two, so the stock moves two times the market. It's a bit volatile. The stock has gone up more than S&P 500 the past 52 weeks. The 52 week low is 35 pence, the high is 137 pence. And the stock is trading between its 200 day and 50 day moving average. This is a really liquid stock. 20 million to 40 million shares are traded each day. Of the 8.37 billion shares outstanding, 8.22 billion are on float. And it has a pretty high institutional ownership. 62% of the shares are held by institutions. The stock has done well the past year, but really struggled the past three years and five years. Analysts are projecting their earnings to grow, but less than their industry and the market. They're also projecting their revenue to grow more than its industry and the market. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have lost over 80% of your investment. The biggest shareholder is Causeway at 9.5%, then Capital Research, MFS Investment, BlackRock, and Vanguard. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have an amazing PE. If you just look at the PE, the company seems really undervalued. But this is just for the trailing 12 months. They obviously can't maintain a 3.5 PE. So you just want to stay on top of their PE, the next few earnings reports. They have a really good price to sales. Their revenue is higher than their market cap. And we can't look at the price to book since they have negative equity. They have 4 billion pounds of intangible assets on their balance sheet. If a company has negative equity, you want to look at the current ratio. If that's far below one, that could be a problem. But their current ratio is 1.3. So they can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. So they're in good shape for the next 12 months. And their quick ratio is about one. They have 2.9 billion pounds of cash on their balance sheet, 3.7 billion of inventory, and 2.3 billion of assets held for sale. The assets held for sale are the assets related to the ITP division they're planning on selling. So they did have negative free cash flow in a trailing 12 months, but they have 3.5 billion pounds of working capital. So they're in good shape for the next 12 months. So hopefully things get closer to back to normal and people start flying again like they did in 2019. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 20 companies in the same industry as Rolls Royce. 
And their PE and price of sales is much better than the average in the industry. We can't look at their price to book. They have a good current ratio. We can't look at the ROE. They're 100% debt since they have negative equity. And they're not a small company, 9.1 billion pounds of market cap. And I converted the market caps to pounds and the average market cap is 24.7 billion pounds. To summarize, I have them trading at a 58% discount, but I'm really bullish on this company. They're such a big supplier of aircraft engines. So they're really well respected and very important in the market. They've been around over 100 years. They play a really important role in Britain's economy. They supplied so many jobs over those 100 plus years. So the British government is very supportive of this company. And I'm pretty sure they're going to do whatever it takes to make sure they don't go bankrupt. And if COVID didn't happen, I think this company would have been five, six pounds by now. And now they're trading a little over one pound because of all the money they lost and all the sales they've lost from COVID. I know it's easy to say, what if COVID didn't happen? But it looks like they got through the worst of it. Hopefully by next year, things are pretty much back to normal. But I said the same thing last year. I ranked their free cash flow as one out of 10, their revenue four out of 10, and their ratio is eight out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.